Good morning. Thanks very much for asking me. Um, as you've heard, my background is a, as a neurologist and a rehab physician, uh, and spasticity. I've been involved in a little bit with pain. And I suppose my interest in cannabis goes back, what, a good few years now, when I was running multiple sclerosis clinics, and talking to the people who came to the clinic found that you know, roughly 50% of those people were using cannabis illegally in various forms to manage their, mainly their spasticity. So I thought, well, there might be something in this. Um, and so I was then involved a little bit in the Sativex uh, launch, which as you, some of you will know, is the only, except Nabilone, is the only um, cannabis-related product available in the UK legally at the moment. So that's a bit of my background. I was asked uh, fairly recently uh, to be part of a, a campaign in the UK called End Our Pain, which is basically getting a, a movement to get cannabis legalized and moved from in the UK, Schedule 1, which is uh, a Misuse of Drugs Act, some of you may be familiar with this, which basically says uh, that cannabis is of no medicinal value. So I want it moved to Schedule 2 or to Schedule 4, uh, so it can be prescribed in the UK. And that campaign is taking some uh, energy now. And yesterday, a parallel, we'll get there, um, there was a, a UK parliamentary group called the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Drug Policy Reform, which has been meeting for some time now, I think several years, uh, to debate this and other related drug policy issues. And they asked me to do a, a review of all the evidence, the medical evidence, that cannabis is a useful product or not. And that's the report uh, there that was published and launched yesterday in the House of Commons, House of Lords in uh, UK and got quite a lot of media publicity, some of you may have seen about that, which was, I think, very gratifying. It was on all the main TV channels and all the dailies, but generally quite supportive, except, of course, for the Daily Mail, uh, which was sort of grudgingly supportive. Um, I, keep, I keep going. I'm doing quite well without the script behind me at the moment. Um, so that was the background to the APBG report and this report. I'll put on the last slide uh, an email contact for me, so if you'd like to see this wonderful document, you're very pleased to do so as it's now launched. Basically, the APBG report included our uh, evidence base. I say our, it was written in collumption with, uh, collumption, uh, with my daughter, who is a clinical psychologist, as it happens. It also had a very good uh, survey of uh, cannabis users in the UK, done by John Liebling, who's in the audience from the UPA. Uh, that was a very good and useful survey. S and uh, also a survey briefly of health professionals uh, that basically, again, showed that most doctors, not all, but most doctors were supportive of cannabis and understood it. Uh, but obviously, uh, a lot of variation about how many people would, rec how many of them would recommend it. So it was a good background to the report, and ultimately, the report, not surprisingly, said that they would uh, favour the legalisation of cannabis for medical purposes and move it uh, from Schedule 1 of the Misuse of Drugs Act to Schedule 4, which enables a doctor to prescribe it. So that's the, that's the thrust of the report. Um, and we hope that, that will, the energy generated yesterday will continue, and that will, may or may not happen. I think it will happen. It's a matter of time considering now the UK is quite a lot behind 11, I think it is, European countries, 24 US states, and 10 or so countries around the globe. We're there. Excellent. Um, you'll forgive the flagrant uh, self-promotion by calling it the Barnes Report, but uh, they called it that yesterday, and I never had a report named after me. Um, so I rather liked that, so I kept it going. Uh, we looked at the, the classic uh, search engines that some of you will be familiar with, Medline and others, and actually there was a great deal of literature on this. You'd be surprised, 20,000 references altogether. Some were duplicated across the databases, and I'm not going to pretend we looked at all 20,000 references, uh, but we did look at the great majority of them and analyze them and rank them according to the American Academy of Neurology criteria in a, in a paper uh, that was published quite recently. What we did, and I won't bore you too much with the detail, but what we were keen on doing is to make our evidence irrefutable. What I wanted to do was to set a very high standard so that the politicians, and remember this is directed at politicians, couldn't argue that the indications we found that were supported scientifically were definitely scientifically credible and robust. Many of you in this audience, and in fact including me, would doubt that some of the criteria, we put a class one study we called it, was the sort of gold standard, if you will, a double-blind, often placebo-controlled study uh, with blind allocation to groups, uh, objective outcome measures, and such like. No one can argue about the scientific quality of that study. 
I'm well aware that some of you will say, well, that's all very well, but it ignores the, if you like, lesser, in inverted commas, evidence of um, expert opinion, anecdote, user surveys, and non-controlled studies. Yes, I accept that entirely, but we wanted to set the standard very unarguably high. So we call those class one studies. We then a little, without going through too much of the detail, um, that's a number of criteria they have to meet, and if they didn't be quite meet those criteria, they were a little less robust, if you will, scientifically. We called them class two. Other controlled trials of various shapes and sizes, class three. And uh, consensus statements, expert opinion, etc. class four. Um, that's a fairly accepted classification. And then, arbitrarily, we thought, well, we've got to tell people about this, bearing in mind it's going to be a lay audience, basically, that reads it in a political audience. So we thought we'd call good evidence if there was two of those class one studies, plus other supporting evidence, plus a good theoretical basis for why it should work. We thought we'd call moderate evidence if there was just one of those class one studies and other support and a theoretical basis, some evidence if there was no class one studies but some other evidence, mainly class two, and we felt we couldn't make a recommendation if they didn't meet those criteria. And I do want to emphasize that the absence of evidence was not the evidence of absence of efficacy. It just means the studies haven't been done yet. So that's an important point to remember, that we're not saying that it doesn't work for some of these indications I'll come to, but we're saying the evidence on this criteria is not, that, not yet there. So that's what we did. Uh, you can criticize that. Feel free to, to be rude and, and tell me that's rubbish after I've finished speaking and have escaped from the stage. But that's what we did. Um, and as I said, really, that was deliberately setting the, the bar to efficacy really very high indeed. So the politicians could not argue about it. They will, but in theory, they shouldn't be able to. This is good quality scientific evidence. Okay. The report itself, I should I, I just briefly uh, go through a bit, a bit of history of cannabis, which I think is important. And I'll perhaps put a little bit of um, a spin on what we found for yesterday for a lot of media attention, what the media focused on. That might be helpful to, to the general discussion today, what they were interested in. S and some were interested in the fact that cannabis has been used as a, as a, as a medicine for something like 4,000 years, so it's got a long history. Surely that means something, and, and some of the media were interested in that, that it's not a, a new weird and wonderful concoction. It's been around and been used for people uh, over a long, long time. And we brought it up to date um, and, and discussed the scheduling uh, on the Misuse of Drugs Act. And then what the media were actually very interested in was the scientific rationale behind it. And this audience knows about that, you know, but many of you better than I do. So I'm not going to go through a long, boring thing on the endocannabinoid system, but telling the media that actually we're all sitting there today producing cannabis in our brains, uh, to paraphrase the science slightly, but that's not far off the truth. We're producing cannabinoid-like chemicals in our brains, and we're understanding more and more about the endocannabinoid system and its uh, effect on um, motor control, its effect on pain, its effect on memory, its effect on brain adaptability and plasticity, as well as the non-neurological metabolic immune system uh, endocrine system effects that are familiar to, th to this audience. And I think the media were very interested in that because suddenly they think, oh, this may be something that has a scientific rationale and it's not just a slightly weird and wonderful drug that happens to work for people. So I think that was very useful to try and tell the media through this report and through other means of the scientific rationale behind cannabinoids and the endocannabinoid system which, of course, I'm not a neuroscientist, but there's a lot uh, unraveling of that over the last 10 years. Really interesting work. We talked then a bit about the plant and the, and the phytocannabinoids and the fact that, of course, they mimic, if that's the right word, the endocannabinoid system. Uh, and we talked a little bit about the really important thing about the balance between THC and CBD. And I think, again, the media and the lay public uh, really don't know or understand, why should they, it's not a criticism, uh, the difference between THC and CBD and the fact there's not just one cannabis. It's like saying, we'll license an antibiotic, just one antibiotic. There's much more than that. There's a whole range of uh, cannabinoids, a lot of which we don't understand anything at all about, and the real difference between THC on one hand and CBD on the other is something that I think the public need educating about. And again, some of the media found that of interest, particularly in the context of anxiety, 
where THC can induce some anxiety in some people, but as we know, CBD has the opposite effect. So that explaining that little bit of that science uh, and, and fact behind it was useful. And we talked about the different cannabis formulations available because a lot of the evidence I'm going to go through in a moment is actually, of course, done on the licensed products, Sativex, and Nabiximols, uh, Nabilone, and Dronabinol, though it's not available in the UK. So a, a lot of the five minutes, a lot of the evidence was on that. And we talked about forms of ingestion and, and uh, inhalation and such like. So quickly, what did we find? We found good evidence on that basis, I've said, for four things. Chronic pain, this won't surprise any of you. Chronic pain of all sorts, that was um, neuropathic pain, post-surgical pain, pain from spasticity, some relation to cancer pain, some studies on that. There were eight class one studies. The evidence was pretty irrefutable for the use of cannabinoids generally, anabilone, sativex, and natural cannabis um, for chronic pain, number one. Number two was good evidence for spasticity. Again, a, a decent number of class one studies, again, mainly done on specific commercial products like Sativex, because they had to go through those studies for their license, but good evidence on other compounds, so that was number two, was spasticity. Number three was nausea and vomiting in the context of chemotherapy. Again, solid scientific evidence for that. And number four, and that was confirmed through the Cochrane Review of 23 controlled trials, incidentally, so it's cross-referenced uh, to other studies. And number four was anxiety, in the context of the CBD. So they were the four things for which we found evidence to be irrefutable. On the, grace, on the, on the basis of uh, moderate evidence, we found moderate evidence, still pretty good quality, I have to say, for appetite stimulation, sleep disorders, fibromyalgia, and PTSD. And that's, you know, again, we're looking at numbers of people involved, that's tens and tens of thousands of people just in the UK. We found some evidence, and probably this sort of surprised some people for agitation in dementia. Epilepsy, there's really good evidence emerging for epilepsy, but it, unfortunately it's not yet fully published. Those studies are coming through. That's mainly drug-resistant childhood epilepsies and main, mainly CBD. Bladder dysfunction, Tourette's, glaucoma, and some aspects of Parkinson's disease. And maybe it's interesting but that we couldn't make a recommendation on these things. And the, interest, the one interesting there is the, the, uh, from John's study... The, the, be, the, the most prevalent use of cannabis um, is for depression in medical terms, but we did not find that on that basis of evidence for that. I'm not saying it doesn't work for cannabis, uh, for depression, of course I'm not, but I'm saying that evidence on the basis of, of these studies didn't confirm that, which is an interesting point. But there was some evidence, uh, but not enough to make a recommendation on these, criteria, on these um, diagnoses. We talked about the short-term effects, because you have to, and the media were very focused on uh, what are the problems of this. Short-term, well-tolerated, we can say that definitely. I remember it for three Ds, dizziness, uh, dry mouth and drowsiness, uh, plus other things that we know about, particularly the THC compound. But generally, 90% plus of people have mild, well-tolerated side effects in the short term. The media are obsessed with the schizophrenia question. I'm sure this is familiar to you. Um, this was our, what we found, uh, which is not controversial, I don't think, that we found that it does probably, and only probably, trigger, let's call it schizophrenia, but it may be a psychotic episode in heavy recreational users, more male than female, for those who have already had an episode uh, or have a family history or genetic predisposition to schizophrenia. Uh, and we probably recommend, like any other drug, the doctor prescribing it uh, should use this as a contraindication. They should be cautious about prescribing it for people who fall into the category of schizophrenia, schizophrenia-like illness, having it or having a family history of it. And I, I don't have a problem with that. Any drug, any drug has contraindications. You have to think carefully about prescribing it for this condition. And why not? And, and a lovely um, uh, paper, familiar to you, Hickman, one minute, uh, show that to stop one schizophrenic episode, you have to stop 10,000 male cannabis users from, from smoking or, or using cannabis and 29,000 women. I think that puts it into context that this is, a, this is a problem, but it's a very small problem in the context of the benefits of the drug. 
Um, we talked briefly about dependency. Again, the, the press were obsessed about it. this is a, a gateway drug and it's addictive, and it was useful to compare it to the figures for alcohol and tobacco. We talked about driving and not having a blanket ban because CBD is perfectly good. For, you can drive as much as you like with CBD. Uh, we talked about the lack of evidence for lung cancer. That was on the press yesterday. Some, frankly, idiot on the TV program said it was a seven-fold increase uh, of lung cancer, I think, when John was on the Good Morning Britain. Um, people just make these things up. There is no evidence for that, particularly if we recommend that it shouldn't be smoked. Vaping or other forms of ingestion is, is much safer, probably, than smoking. We talked about the li very limited evidence of cognitive effects in the long term as opposed to the short term. And we talked about some of the evidence about loss of brain volume in some of the parts of the brain. No clear evidence for that. Uh, and, but, and again, even if that happens, there's no evidence for having an adverse consequence as a result of that. So we talked about all those things, and there you go. You were just about to panic, weren't you? Um, so the report's quite comprehensive. I've summarized it quite quickly. But as I say, if you would like a copy, I'd be very willing. Just note that down, drop me an email, and I'd be happy to send you a PDF version of it. So I hope yesterday's campaign was useful in the UK terms, that it would take us further forward. And um, I'm very pleased to talk to you, anyone uh, I'm here for the day, about how we did that and how the media reacted and how hopefully important it's going to be to try and change the law in the UK. Thank you very much.